Welcome to Thinking Deeply About Primary Education, the podcast that makes time and space to think about pedagogy, teaching and learning, professional development, anything of interest to time poor but enthusiasm rich primary teachers. This week, I'm joined by Elliot Morgan. Hello. And we're going to focus on interviews, school based interviews of all types, and how we can get, make sure we're as prepared as possible from application right the way through to interview and the acceptance. But first, Morgs, what you reading for? Hey, what you reading for? I have uh, recently just finished the uh, research ed guides to explicit and direct instruction. I'm, I mean, it was massive confirmation bias for me believing in direct instruction. But I thought it was an incredible read. It, it talked about like project follow through. It talked about how to apply um, direct instruction in different subjects, like in English and in, in science. It talked about like building it into curriculum design and how Engelman talked about how examples should be introduced. So yeah, I highly recommend that. And then I've just started, what does this look like in the classroom? I'm about 10 to 20 pages in for that. Enjoying that so far. Different style than that. It's more of like a interview format style. What about you, Kieran? What are you reading for? So I've got a, a very, very new paper. I think, you know, maybe a week old or so. And it's called Stochastic and Deterministic Views of Statistics, a Pedagogical Perspective. And it's um, it's from a group of researchers at the University of Gothenburg and includes Ferenc um, Marton, um, who obviously uh, has his own sort of brand of uh, variation theory. And this one builds on variation theory to explore statistics. And it's almost like a, another piece of that variation puzzle. And uh, yeah, really interesting read and a really short read too, because it seems like from the name, it could be quite dense, but actually it's not. Past my level of understanding, I think, sounds dense to me, or it would be dense for me. No, I mean, it's it's really just about um, two different ways of interpreting statistics and teaching statistical interpretation or analysis. And it, it essentially comes to the idea that if you, you know, if you utilize the principles of variation theory, we understand, you know, the, the students in this, I think they were postgraduate or undergraduate students, they understand uh, a whole lot more. So we're going to explore job interviews and getting ready for both the application and interview process. How important is visiting a school before applying from a job? If we start right at the very beginning. I should probably like preface my answer by saying that like I'm no expert in, in interviews or anything, but I did, I did fail a lot of interviews and fail a lot of job applications and I, and I earned an incredible lot along the way. Um, so everything I'm gonna sort of reference here is stuff that I learned. So and, and one of those things was that initially I didn't go and visit a school. Uh, not not always. Sometimes it would be the visit would be during a school day and I couldn't get there or like the school was too far from um, where I was working. So I couldn't get there in time after school either. So initially I, I apply. I used to apply without always visiting. And I found that I just wasn't getting invited to to interview at those schools. And then when I spoke to some heads, they'd said that they wouldn't they would never consider a candidate who hadn't visited the school first. And which, of course, makes obvious, obvious sense, doesn't it? Um, but in terms of like being the applicant, it's important to go to the school to establish if it's the right fit for you. I was sort of applying blindly um, without look, going to visit school and, and it might not have been the right fit for me. Um, and, and a website and like the school's Twitter page can portray one side of what a school's like. But going to visit a school actually gives you the reality of what the school is like. So by visiting, you have the chance to um, unearth any information that may either prevent you from wanting to apply in the first place or it may help your application should you choose to apply. Um, now a big tip I would recommend would be to try and visit during the school day if possible. Um, ov obviously like you're at the behest of the, the school that you're visiting if they they can't accommodate that then then so be it. But if you're able to go and visit like during a lesson time or during break time you can see the inner workings of the school like see if behavior is good there um see what teaching is like and and so on the reason it's important to visit a school that I, i'd say is, there's two main reasons there the first one is a chance to introduce yourself so present yourself as someone who's like knowledgeable who's polite someone who's easy to get along with etc etc but then it's also a chance for you to gather information that you can use in your written application so i would highly recommend taking a notepad every time they write down something that like relates to your experience that you can put into your application note it down um, so, and asking loads of questions. So like, what, what um, are the areas for improvement in your school at the moment? 
what type of person do you want to join the, your team? What is it like working here and so on and so on? It's all incredibly value, valuable information that you can just sort of drip feed into your written application further down the line. I think you also get a sense of whether or not the position is right for you as well, you know, because I think I remember very early on, maybe two, three years into my career, going for a deputy head position. And it was only when I got there that I realized, no, I'm not ready for this. <laughs> you know, because you've almost got that mental space to think about things a bit more um, clearly and, and being present somewhere, I think, helps with that. So it makes total sense what you're saying, Elliot. I think, um, yeah, yeah, definitely try and visit, you know, oh, there was a really good analogy on Twitter recently. It was like, you know, possibly by buying a car, would you would you buy a car without looking at it first? You know, so why would you make a, a decision yeah. like this before doing it? Well, I, like, I just remembered I visited a school. This is for, like, a senior leadership role. Um, but it was, you were class, full-time class-based, but you were meant to be, like, an assistant head or something. And um, I spoke to them about, oh, so in terms of leadership time, how much time would I get? And they were like, Oh, uh, well, we can sort of negotiate that. You'll be in class all the time. And that, that to me was just like, right, uh, that's alarm bells. Like, how am I meant to, am I meant to do this on top of being full-time class-based and not given any time? So, so I was like, I'm not going to apply here. I mean, should teachers worry about going to visit during the school day? Because I know some people don't want to take more time than necessary off, but really, they probably should, shouldn't they? Like I said, if, if either your school can't cover you or the school you're visiting can't accommodate for it, it's not the end of the world. Um, like you can always go visit after school or before school, whenever suits both parties. But if at all possible, visiting during the school day is absolutely ideal because when you're walking around an empty school at 5 p.m., they can, they can sell you a dream very easily. And then when you go to work there, it can be something incredibly different to what you were told. So actually walking around and, and living it, so, for example, I went to visit another school. Um, I think it again was like assistant head role or something. And um, well, in fact, I was interviewing there, and the room we were interviewing in was a room that they would uh, send children to during lunchtime if they'd been misbehaving or something. So I was like, okay, perfectly fine. But the amount of children—I was only in the room for 15, 20 minutes. The amount of children that got sent to the room in that time, even though like it'd been moved to a different room that day, to me was a big alarm bell. I was like, that's an awful lot of children in the space of 15, 20 minutes getting sent here. So is behavior management an issue here? Or do I really wanna do I really want to get the job and so on? So it, it's about trying to uncover anything that may prevent you from applying because by going to an empty school, you won't necessarily see those those issues. It might be brushed under the carpet, for want of a better phrase. And I think there was a question someone asked on Twitter about them um what the etiquette was around informing your school that you were looking elsewhere. And I mean, I've got lots of friends who are head teachers or in senior management positions. And I think all anybody ever really wants is for their staff to be upfront with them and to sort of say, you know, this, this is what these, these are what my aspirations are. This is what I'm thinking about. You know, there, there are many, many reasons why you want, might want to move school. Um, but being upfront, I don't know. Is that, is that your experience as well, Elliot? 100%, 100%. I've, 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 obviously this is personal, personal experience, but I've always found being truthful and honest with my line manager, my head teacher or whatever has always benefited me in the long run. And I've always had that working relationship where I have been honest and so on, because if I am to get a job, then they're going to need to be looking for another teacher or an assistant head or whatever it may be. So I, I didn't want to leave them in the lurch in that sense. The other thing is, is that you may find if you go to your head and say, look, I'm, I'm actually thinking about leaving. As you said, here's my aspirations. They might go, well, hang on. How can we help you achieve those aspirations here? Like, how can, can we send you on an MPQ or whatever it may be to make sure that you're achieving those aspirations as well as staying there? So, yeah, it's something to, to consider at length, but it, it, it's case dependent on your relationship with your head teacher, I guess. You've been to the school. You have, you know, liked what you've seen, so to speak, you want to apply, what tips are there for completing the written job application? As I mentioned right at the start, I have failed an awful lot of these. So I've got quite a few tips that, that I've sort of un, uh, learned uh, along the way. Annoyingly, there is not yet a single application form for uh, teaching roles across the country. Every teaching form, uh, job form that you fill in is like slightly different, but it all largely ask for the same stuff it will need your national insurance number your employment history qualifications 
uh, details of your the people you're using for references and so on and so on. So my first tip would be to have all of that information handy just in a Word document somewhere that you can just copy paste across, very simple. Another tip would be any CPD you have done, keep track of it, keep track of the dates, the certificates and so on. Because when I was filling in um, forms, I'd have to be, I kept thinking, oh, when did I do that? Was that three years ago, two years ago? Largely the dates don't matter that much, but I, I was panicking that I'd maybe forgotten some CPD altogether because I didn't keep track of it. Now, the most time consuming part of any application is the personal statement. And it is absolutely gutting when you spend hours and hours writing one and then you don't even get an email to say like you've been unsuccessful. So this is where the, the bulk of my advice is going to be. So whether you're applying for a teacher role or an SLT role, the job should have a job description and then a, a personal sort of job specification. In my experience, schools uh, are mostly only ever asking for a response to the job specification. Um, because after all, that is that document lays out what it is they're looking for. Now, a job specification is split normally into essential criteria. So uh, you must have a Q QTS, qualified teacher status, uh, and then uh, desirable criteria, like it is desirable that you've taught in key stage one. So it's not like you don't have to have it to get the job, but if you do have it, it, it sort of bolsters your, your application. When it comes to essential, if you're looking at that criteria and, and you realize that you don't meet a lot of the criteria there, then I wouldn't waste your time and apply. If it's one or two things that you're missing, fine, go for it, because not necessarily everyone's going to tick all the boxes. Now, desirable criteria, I would try and include this as much as possible where you meet it, because the desirable criteria will be what sets you apart from other people applying, because it's stuff that not necessarily everyone will have uh, experience in. These criteria, be they essential or desirable, are normally laid out uh, on the job specification in subheadings. So my third tip is to use those same subheadings in your application. When you're responding, saying how you meet the job specification, use those same subheadings that are laid out in the job spec. It's normally like qualifications, experience, professional development, wherever it may be. So I have each of those subheadings. And then um, under those subheadings, I would write the paragraph uh, that shows how you meet the criteria. It's important here to avoid being like, unclear, avoid being waffly, uh, because that sort of thing hinders your chances. Um, sometimes jobs can have an insane amount of applicants. And if in the first paragraph, yours doesn't really make sense, they're probably not going to read on. Think of that job spec as a checklist. You should be ticking it off uh, as you're writing it. But th on the other side, when you hand it in, the head teacher or whoever looks at it will be doing the same thing. They'll be matching how you meet that job spec. So the whole point of this idea is to lay it out for them very clearly so that it's impossible for them not to see it. You write out the criterion in bold and then you give your experience for how you meet it. I call this the CTE approach. So the criterion, then example. If we take, this is from a job spec I found online. There's one statement, essential criterion, and it says good knowledge of the national curriculum and statutory testing. A poor example of this, a non-example would be, this is what I would write if, the, if I was writing a poor example. I have good knowledge of the national curriculum and statutory testing because I was curriculum and assessment lead. Just that. Now, being cur curriculum and assessment lead is incredibly helpful here, but this is a poor example because it doesn't provide any examples as to how that role and that experience provides them with the good knowledge. Uh, so this person spec is asking the candidate to demonstrate their good knowledge of the curriculum and statutory testing for examples. So this is how I would write my clear example. So having taught in four different year groups, including the end of both key stages, I possess, and then this is the bit in bold, that criterion statement, good knowledge of the national curriculum and statutory testing. While I was curriculum lead, I developed the maths curriculum in line with the national curriculum. I supported subject leads in developing their subject curricula. As a uh, assessment lead and reading SATS marker, my knowledge of uh, statutory testing is stronger than average, blah, 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 and so on and so on. You get the idea. So while that's not necessarily like a perfect example, it's infinitely better than that, that first one I gave. Because if you don't include examples, then I honestly would not expect an interview. So, because there will be other candidates who meet all of the criteria, if not most of them. So you've got to think carefully about how you do too. So personally, I lay out the personal statement, as I just said. You have the, the um, subheadings from the job spec. And then underneath those subheadings, I have mini paragraphs for each criterion, how I met it. The very first sentence will say, 
will have that criteria in bold. So I possess good knowledge of the national curriculum, blah, blah, blah. And then I go into my experience and how it links to that criterion. Then the next paragraph is the next criterion in bold, my evidence and so on and so on and so on until I've done the entire job spec. And, and I mentioned earlier when we were talking about visiting a school, about gathering information on a school visit, you can drip that, drip feed that stuff in. So you can say stuff like, um, during my visit, you, uh, you mentioned writing as an area for development across the school. Well, having, having been English lead and a writing moderator, I am confident that I can support the school in not only improving the teaching and learning of writing, but also the assessment of it or, or whatever it may be. It's very easy to, to feed that stuff in and tie it in. Um, and again, I, I would put those bits in bold because you're linking back to having visited the school and, the, and them saying that. Um, so it, it shows that you've listened and you, you've thought about it and so on. Another tip linked to writing personal statements is that you may not get the, the very first job you apply for. You may end up applying for a few. So I would keep a bank of these paragraphs just in a Word document somewhere because often they do ask, they do have similar criteria, not always exactly the same. So you can just tweak them rather than rewriting it um, altogether. Um, so just having those that as a bank makes it very easy to copy paste along. Just like I said earlier, with having your national insurance number and your salary scale and employment history and so on. Just to sort of end on this question here, I, I uh, met this teacher at a wedding a couple of summers ago and he said he went for a job that had 70 other people apply for it. It was a classroom role. It was like year four teacher. And he, had, he said there were over 70 applicants for that single role. If you're keeping that in mind and you're making sure that you're laying out your answers very easily for the reader to find that essential criteria that you've referenced it there, it, it makes it increases your chance by a lot. Because if there's 70 people, are they realistically going to read all 70 uh, personal statements at length? I was I would argue probably not. If they're reading a few paragraphs and they think, no, they're not really meeting the essential criteria they're just going to move on to the next candidate and, and so on so it's about making their job much easier and then improving your chances for interviewing in doing so yeah i mean i've heard of other industries i mean i've never seen it in teaching but other industries where they go through the application looking for reasons to strike you off the list and the, and, and they'll just literally whereas in schools we're almost looking at a problem so okay we've got this problem we want to solve who's the person who's the player for this position but in other industries, people are like, oh, well, the, the handwriting, the, the spelling, you know, the absence of examples, th those kind of things will be detected off pretty quickly. So I'm, there must be something on a psychological level, you know, even if not deliberate. So one head I spoke to said that when uh, they're reviewing applications, they literally, they do have the, the job spec there and they literally tick off against it as they're reading for applications. So it's important to reference those criteria. And then. Again, anecdotally, speaking to um, a friend who was interviewing at their school, they got through an application that was just riddled with spelling mistakes and so on. So they just didn't didn't bother reading any further because that shows that there's not been careful consideration and thought into it. If if you haven't spell checked it and so on, then then you're not likely the uh, the right candidate. That's the sort of inferences that they could make because at the end of the day, they're only human, aren't they? So they're they're going to make inferences based on what you've written. So it's important to present it as as perfectly. Uh, as you can to avoid any of those sort of issues. Yeah. I mean, I think this is pretty tried and tested because we've had a lot of friends and sort of colleagues ask for advice about how to apply for jobs. And, you know, it, it seems to be working for people um, so far. You know, even if I think right back at the start of the pandemic when Lloyd was going for his deputy head position, we had maybe a, a three or four hour conversation about uh, <laughs> what he should do. Yeah, I remember it well. And I, I know that I certainly reached out to everyone as well for support using like the discord that we've got and yeah reaching out to more knowledgeable others for their help so then you've done this you followed your advice you've written a really good application you followed the cte approach how should we prepare for the actual interview the big trap i fell into was trying to rehearse answers and i'll explain why that is personally have it like attended loads of interviews, but I've also conducted interviews for teachers and, and leadership roles. And, and I've seen people make the same mistake. You should not try and rehearse answers at length because you will never get the same questions every time that you go for a role. And you may not get the same questions you find online from the key or TES or wherever it may be. So because of that, I'd, I'd advise against trying to rehearse them. I have found personally, it is better to, pre to prepare 
specific examples in your head around generic areas. So if you're going for a teacher role, think about examples of how uh, you've responded to behavior, what you think like effective teaching is, um, how you plan lessons, what, safeguarding, adaptive teaching, and so on and so on. If you're going for an SLT role, think about specific examples of how you've had like full school impact when you've uh, delegated to others and what like good leadership is and so on and so on. So I have those bank of examples that I like, or maybe have like eight to 10, something that's very sim easy ones to remember. And then the approach that I use when I've been in interviews and I, I get asked questions is what's called as the, what's known as the star approach. And I learned this from um, a friend who's a civil servant. Apparently it's the, what they use when they conduct interviews there. So the star approach is S for situation, T for task, A for analysis, and then R for results. So that's the star. But then my friend also talked about having a second R for reflection. So if I give you an example here and then, I'm going to test Kieran and give him a, a chance to, to apply this approach. Oh dear. <laughs> um, so I'll give you it. So let's pretend that I'm going for a teacher interview. And the question they ask me is, uh, tell us about a time when you've dealt with misbehavior. In my mind, I'm thinking of a time that I felt I've dealt with misbehavior. So the first thing is a situation. I need to talk about a situation. Right. Situation. I had a child in my class who would call out a lot, uh, and this was affecting the attention of the other pupils. So that was my situation. Then I'm thinking, right, now I need to explain what the task had. So the task was in my head. I had to then consider how I was going to stop this from happening. Right, fairly simple. Uh, the next one is action. So what actions did I take to, to, to sort this issue out? Well, uh, I moved the child to the front of the class, and then I told them that they have a whiteboard and a pen, and that if they have an answer, they write down the whiteboard, and then I will look at it rather than them, them shouting out. That's my action. Then I have R for results. The result was this led to a drastic reduction in them calling out uh, and then others stayed focused on, on their task for longer too. And then I'd add in reflection as well. So in, ref in reflection, um, if in future classes, if I had the same issue again, I think I would encourage like a no hands up strategy as a whole class strategy, because that would prevent any calling out in the first place. So th there's that, that method. So situation, task, analysis, result, reflection. The, the beauty of this approach is that it keeps your answers very methodical. It, it sort of demonstrates you as somebody who, who thinks carefully about situations before they act on them. And it shows that you reflect on your practice and how you, you can improve. It's okay to admit that you didn't do stuff perfectly first time round. The best teachers we know are the ones who reflect on their practice and then they get better because of it. And that's a vital skill, whether you're going for a SLT role, teacher role, whatever. So I, I would, I, that's why I really like, like that approach and it, it like I said it really shows that you, you think about stuff in a very granular level and you go through it one step at a time so we're going to spin this round on Kieran then Kieran has worked at like a senior leadership level le leading maths wasn't it across like a trust of schools is that right yeah yeah done that yeah <laughs> yeah so um I, I, we'll, we'll talk through it together so the question is though I want you to tell me about a time when you have had whole school impact so think about a time relating to math. You've had a whole school impact, yeah? Right. What was the situation? What was the the issue, basically, at the start? What was the situation? So the situation was pupils were performing well in math lessons, but they didn't seem to be retaining information or the knowledge, and the school would like to do or schools would like to do something about this because, obviously, if they can't use it further down the line, that's a bit of an issue. So that's the situation, I think. Yeah, no, that's perfect sense. Yeah, I think you could you could rephrase situation as like issue or problem, but that doesn't fit with the uh, acronym of start, does it? So. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that's your situation. Yeah, great, great one to pick out. So kids aren't retaining information; it's affecting their learning. So, what was the task you had ahead of you? Before we go into actions, it's very easy to conflate those. What task? So, when it comes to task, I tend to think about what is it that you have to think about doing in order to go and resolve this issue yeah so w without them being too specific and making an actions i think my actions would need to involve the introduction of retrieval practice and perhaps some upskilling of teachers with regards to cognitive science and the sort of the, the sort of the, the simple memory model um and so I'm, I'm trying not to literally list tasks but i'm thinking that's the avenue I need no, to that's have. great that's all that stuff's great. You, you've highlighted like what it is, the big picture that needs to be done. 
So then if we go now to actions, so you talked about bringing in retrieval practice. So like what action would you do to bring that in? Nice. I mean, that's the easy bit. I think you introduce it and then you follow up with the coaching, you know, so some sort of CPD, some sort of introduction, some sort of model of how we'd like to um, develop retrieval practice because it looks different in different contexts. And then we're going to do some sort of deliberate practice and some some coaching and refinement. And then we'll, re- you know, we'll review after a couple of months, I think, is the short version of that. Yeah, no, that's good. That's very good. And then what was the result? So you've taken all these actions. What was the result of taking those actions? I mean, teachers were aware of what they needed to do to support pupils in committing information to long-term memory. They were also able to design tasks which sort of supported this. And I think pupils retained more and were able to use that knowledge um, in more complex maths further down the line. But obviously we had five years, so um, we had a lot of time to embed this. Yeah, good. And then the the final one, the final one is um, reflection. Like if you were to do it again, or was there any issues that you noticed that you would change differently or do differently this time? Is this like, um, what's your greatest weakness? Well, I'm just too much of a perfectionist kind of thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, along those lines. I mean, honest answer, probably would have codified things a lot sooner. Um, you know, I really, um, it would have brought more people on board quickly. I mean, we had lots of early adopters, so it was fine. But if I could say, okay, here are my four key things I want you to remember from this. And code, like I said, codified pretty much everything I did shortly after that. But it was the first thing we did in 2017. At that point, I hadn't quite refined how I was delivering information. You know, So that would be my the one thing I'd change. But it didn't make a massive difference in the end. So if we, if we put all of that together, I think you've got a great answer to the question. So the question was, tell us about the time you've had whole school impact. I'm just going to summarize here, like, feel free to correct me if you're wrong. I'm just going to pretend I'm you, set, putting it all as one, yeah? So you said, um, the issue that I noticed is that it, children were performing well in math lessons, but they were struggling to retain information. So I realized that I need to introduce uh, retrieval practice on, on a whole school level, and that, that included upskilling teachers. In order to do that, I led extensive CPD, and then after CPD, we we had a, a program of coaching to ensure that teachers were implementing retrieval practice properly. The result of all of this was that teachers were not only designing better tasks, but that children ended up retaining more because of it. And if I were to do it again, I think I would have codified this sooner, and that I would have refined my delivery of this knowledge to teachers, and it may have sped up the process or well. Does that make sense? Does that sound about right? Nice. That sounds brilliant. I mean, I give you the job, yeah. Elliot. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, you get the you get the idea about like it's a very methodical process, and this is something that like I would perhaps I, I said don't rehearse the answers, but I would practice responding to questions in in this manner, um, and it becomes quite second nature very quickly um, because it, it all follows on from one another, doesn't it? Like here's a problem, I had to think about what to do. Here's what I did. That was the result. What would I do next? It's, it becomes very quick. I found that when when I rehearsed answers um, and they gave me a question that I wasn't expecting, I, I would panic and I would try and retrofit a rehearsed answer into it. And even though it didn't really necessarily relate to it, and then I've ended up giving a bad a bad answer. And and I see that I, I did that mistake, but I also uh, saw a lot of people that I interviewed do that exact same mistake. So that's why I think having these examples, following that star approach with the examples would be much more effective for you. Yeah, I can, I can totally see that. I mean, I've got a tendency to go around the houses sometimes and I'll forget mid paragraph where I am in my response. I mean, not necessarily in the job interview, but just in conversation in general. So I think it, it helps you avoid that, doesn't it? And, you know, you can see how well rehearsed you were because you were able to turn my rambling into a really succinct answer with no yeah, prep that, at all. Yeah. And that's only because in my head, I'm like, S, what is S, T, and so on. So, and then like linked to that, you make a great point about rambling. We're all prone to do it. We think in an interview that if I just keep talking, they're going to keep writing down good answers here. Um, whereas like you could just be waffling, waffling. So something that I started doing towards the end of like the last few interviews I did was I would take in uh, a notepad with me. Um, and then when I was asked a question, I would just say to them, I'm just going to write that question down in this notepad because I want to make sure that I answer it properly. And nobody ever had an issue with it. And in fact, I think it actually reflected better on me that I was like, trying to take my time side and the benefit of that was that well one 
it stopped me just rushing into answers and then which i may have started well but then i'd jump off a cliff with it would go into a mad tangent and be rubbish the second thing was that it gives you time to think it gives you time to think about the the star approach the, the example you're going to link to or whatever it may be and the other thing sort of a bit cheeky is that in that notepad you might even have the examples or like some notes for yourself nothing wrong with that there's nothing wrong with that it's not meant to be a sort of like memory test um so yeah that's another thing i would recommend doing nice inside tip for uh or for for teachers there yeah it, it just it makes so much sense i can see this being really helpful for a lot of people the actual interviews themselves they normally come with tasks and depending on the type of role you're going for these will differ what tips are there for approaching these tasks yeah so there's a variety of tasks that can come up um whether you're going for a teacher role or slt role the common teacher ones will be well to plan and teach a lesson um often the lesson will only be maybe 30 minutes maximum sort of 45 what they're looking for there is that you can sort of identify clear outcomes that there's sort of clear stages to the lesson that there's adaptive teaching to uh, support children who may struggle that there's a lot of questioning and so on and so on and so on um a tip that i would give there is to give a copy of your slides or your plan to the observers but not just the plan or the slides annotated uh plan or slides because it demonstrates what you're doing at each point so um i i did a lesson on um writing or something i think and i, I gave a copy of the slides and then i written next to it like the reason i'm going to do this is because of direct instruction blah blah, blah. the reason i'm going to do this is to like this is a hinge question that i'm going to check for understanding and if they don't have it i'm going to go back to this slide or whatever it may be and it just made it uh clearer for the observer what it is they were observing because when people are observing you teach everyone has their own biases and it's very easy for them to interpret something you've done as one thing when it could be another I, I one interview i taught a lesson and i went down the very explicit direct instruction route it was very granular and so on and the the feedback i got afterwards was that was a very safe lesson and i had to sort of well not argue but i had to sort of discuss with them like why i had intended it to be safe like i don't know any of the children and i know like this is direct instruction is incredibly effective blah 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 whereas if i if i'd have known about like giving them the plan or sides annotated in advance and i'd done it then it would have been clearer to them why it was laid out the way it was well i've got a, a funny anecdote here well I, I think it's funny anyway i got invited to interview for a role i had to teach a lesson as part of it now i uh, had prepared this lesson that I taught in previous interviews. It was like a year four grammar lesson on subordinating conjunctions. I thought, great, I'll use that. Don't reinvent the wheel. So I go um, and teach it. There's a lady interviewing at the same time as me, and she was teaching in the room next door. And then the two observers were just going to go between both lessons and sort of observe us. I'd start my lesson, and I've got maybe, I don't know, the observers are in there for a maximum of maybe three or four minutes out of the, the 30 that we're teaching. Well, that was a bit odd, but like, I don't know, maybe they saw something they liked and it's okay. Maybe I've got through to the next stage. Anyway, after the lesson, I get brought into the interview room and I speak, I speak to them. About it, and the first question they asked me was, um, did you find that lesson online? And I said, no, I, uh, I actually made those slides myself. Um, and they went, well, that, that's weird because Somebody else who interviewed at 9 a.m. this morning taught that exact same lesson with those exact same slides. And that's when I'd remembered that I'd put those slides on TES. <laughs> and somebody had just Googled year four interview lesson, downloaded it and used it. Now, <laughs> I tried to explain to the gentleman that I had made them, but he did not believe me. Um, so I guess a tip there would be to not download anything like that online and, and to, to create your own uh, materials from which to use. <laughs> That was a, a grave mistake on my part. Um, <laughs> funny looking back at it, but at the time, I was like, oh, I'm actually just like essentially, well, potentially lost a job because of this. Like they didn't come observe me properly because they thought I'd copied somebody else. So yeah, don't make that same that same mistake. I, I can't believe you wouldn't believe you. Did you not just show them on, on the website? I, I, I was like, look, I can get it off. I'll get to yes off my phone. I'll show you. He, he, by that point, he was just like moving on. Wasn't, wasn't particularly interested in it. So and like it's, it harks back to that point we made earlier about the written statements like you don't have their attention for long so capture their attention while you have it and that was the mistake i'd made in in 
using those same slides. Um, another task that you may get to do um, in the teacher interview is some sort of interaction with pupils. Sometimes this is just sort of like more formal, like sat in a room with six of them. Other times it might be like sitting at a table at lunchtime while the kids are eating and, and chatting with them. Um, and what they really want to see here is that you can interact with people in sort of a friendly manner, that you can listen well, that you have, uh, or you can build a rapport with people, so you can have an open dialogue. Um, try and make them laugh and smile if you can. I wouldn't worry too much about this interview. Don't, don't let that part of the interview rather. Don't try and prepare too much of it because in my experience, you get some wildly different questions. I've had stuff like, why do you want to work at this school? But then I've also had, uh, if you were a chocolate bar, what would you be? So <laughs> you can't really prepare for those sorts of things. Just keep in mind that like they're kids uh, and to like keep your answers like very short, joking if you can, like uh, build on what the children have said. Oh yeah, I like that too. And, and so on and so on. When it comes to um, SLT interviews, the tasks are sort of uh, much more cemented. Like you'll get a fair few ones that prop up a lot. So uh, the first one is an intro task. If you're not familiar with that, an intro task is where you're given sort of a selection of problems that you've got to respond to, and you need to uh, put them into an order that you would respond to them in. Sort of under this guise that like you've walked in uh, into the school at 8 a.m. and someone's given you that there's these 10 problems happening simultaneously, and it, like obviously it would never happen. Um, but you have to probably, like think about which ones you do. So the tips there would be safeguarding is always the highest priority. Whichever of those uh, issues is safeguarding, that's number one straight away. Nothing else goes above safeguarding. Following that, staff and pupil well-being are a high priority. So once it's a safeguarding thing, if it's something like um, a staff member is crying or something like that, or a pupil's crying, et cetera, et cetera, those sort of things should be considered as high priority because it's the well-being of, of those. Is it a task or an issue that you can delegate to somebody else? So I remember one, it was like um, the front gate hasn't opened and there's children lining up outside where it's like, well, I'll send the site manager to go and open the gate rather than me going to, the, to go and do it myself. And it means I can respond to other stuff. So think about the, uh, the immediacy needed for the response. Does it need to be responded to right now? Does it need me to respond to it? Or can I send another member of staff? Uh, and also consider whether those issues affect the running of the school day because that can di dictate the immediacy. So that one I mentioned about pupils standing outside, lining up and the gate hasn't opened, uh, like it's on a main road as well. So like it's a safeguard issue because they're on a main road, it's very busy, uh, but it's also affecting the start of the school day, which is gonna like have a knock on effect. So that has gotta be a priority. Often in that task, you're not just given uh, a slot to sort of say the numbers of priority. You're also given a chance to explain why you put certain things there. So explain those in depth and remember, as I've, I'll say it again, safeguarding is always, uh, always number one. Other ones you can do, there's like a goldfish bowl task where they sort of sit you with other candidates and they get you to discuss a scenario, a scenario or approach. I've only ever had to do that twice in all the interviews I've done. Um, the the big mistake I made in one of those is that I had in my mind some great answers i waited for other people to speak and then somebody said every single thing i wanted to say so i'd run out of ideas to say and it looked like i was just copying him so don't rush to interrupt people or anything like that but make sure you get your points across and where possible try and build constructively on what other people have said and that includes if you disagree then then say i'm going to have to politely disagree with that because i think we should do xyz whatever it may be yeah i've done a few goldfish bowls in my time and it it doesn't necessarily suit my sort of naturally introverted position or like um, disposition, but I have had um, experience in terms of thing. I've realized what I shouldn't have done, and then I've had to go successfully in in subsequent events, if that makes sense. Um, and so, like, I mean, they don't want. I mean, the, when people are looking out, you don't really want to be the last one to speak, you know. So it might be you're being polite, you're giving everybody a chance to take part and stuff, but equally. You know, at the the risk of losing your respo responses to someone else, I think the people observing you are, are looking out to see about how you interact with other people, and that doesn't necessarily get sort of marked down as, as a positive if you are so polite that you're going to divert, um, you know, until everyone else has spoken. I mean, and like you say, building other people's answers, there are ways to show the strength of your idea by being polite and saying, yeah, I think that's a great idea. Have you considered... And then you bring in, you know, your your alternative because then, yeah, it it shows how you know because humans don't interact like this in the real world. 
but in that kind of situation, these are the kind of things people are looking for, you know? I mean, in terms of the trade tasks, never done one. They weren't really in vogue in the schools that I've applied, I've worked in. Um, but whenever I've seen other people's lists, I would delegate all of it, really. I'd be all delegate, delegate, delegate. You know, so I'm glad I haven't had to do one yet. Uh, so every uh, leadership role I went for, be it assistant head or deputy head, I had to do an intro task every single time. So um, they, they are certainly like on vogue at, uh, at the moment. But when it comes to intro tasks, if you just Google some, there's plenty online that you can practice with. Another uh, thing to keep in mind with those is that there's no... There's no right order per se. The only thing that should that that there is like sort of an agreed answer on is the safeguarding issue. So it's like if you've got a child who comes to the head teacher's office, their their arms are covered in bruises and they're crying and they say I don't want to talk to you. Well, that's a significant priority because there could be a potential safeguarding issue there. If you've got like I remember one, it was like you've got an email from a parent and it's and it says that they're really happy with how the teaching is going in the school it's like well that's the last thing i'm going to get to because i don't it, there's no immediacy to that at all um so yeah it's just keeping those sort of general tips in in um in mind um I'm just trying to think so other ones you get like uh, delivering an assembly um that's the sort of testing your ability to talk to children to engage them possibly to deal with low level behavior although i'd find that quite unlikely that they'd be looking for that um so the advice here would be to plan that assembly well in advance and then know it inside out because um, technology can always fail you. So it's good to have that plan B. Um, and I, like, I don't want to scare anyone, but I've heard like sort of horror stories of people turn up to school and like that they've in intentionally turned the computer off and, or something like that. So that you have, I know, like awful. Um, and if you're a school that does that, I, I highly discourage that. Because as, as Kieran said, it's like these aren't real world situations if you're like forcing somebody into it. Um, so yeah, be prepared um, when it comes to that. Just another couple of quick ones, data tasks. Uh, did you ever have to do data tasks? Yeah, I've been given rears on lines and, and two hours to yeah. sort it out, that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's a common one is like, we'll give you half an hour for here's some data and then you got 10 minutes to present on it. Um, and essentially they're just like, they're looking for, can you spot any issues or like negative trends? Um, and then you may or may not get the, the chance to explain like what you would do to, to resolve it. Um, so yeah, fairly straightforward. That just my advice to that be to read through it very, very carefully uh, and make sure you haven't missed anything because uh, it's very easy to rush in those um, those situations. I've also been asked to write an action plan. You just got to make sure that sort of thing you consider all the key factors, all the stakeholders. So like the cost of stuff, how long it will take, um, the responsibilities, who's involved, when you're going to review it. The actions you'll take, the active ingredients, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I guess it's important to keep in mind that uh, there may be a task that's specific to the role you're applying for. So if you're applying for the role of assessment lead, then they might give you a task linked to assessment. They, if you're applying for a role as a um, safeguarding lead, they might give you a, a task to do with safeguarding, and so on and so on. Uh, and to keep that in mind, because there have been many interviews where I've turned up thinking I'm very well prepared here, and they've given me a task I've never seen before. How do you navigate the lunch time? You know, because normally you're spending with the other members of staff so they can get a handle on what you're like and things, you know. Do you any tips for that? So there have been a couple of times where I've sort of been like flunked in a um into a staff room. And I mean, yeah, you've like hit the nail on the head there. That is just whether they're trying to test you or not, or they're just sticking you in there so you can have your lunch, engage with people, talk to them, say hello, like hi, nice to meet you. Um if you can like what's it like to work here and so on just come across as someone who's friendly because if the head teacher is going to speak to staff afterwards and say like who did you like which they can they i mean i imagine they would do informally like oh, who do you like um, same with the, the pupil voice you want to come across as someone who's going to get mentioned um because when it comes to these interview processes you've got the interview itself you might have like a date to task you might have pupil voice you might have to do a presentation and they're not going to pick someone necessarily just off doing one and one of those it's a collation of how you've done across the, the selection of stuff. So yeah, why not just engage with them, say hello, be polite, etc. I mean, there's lots of great advice there. I mean, probably the thing that sticks out the most from all of that is the idea of annotating your plans. Because when I talk to teachers, when I'm supporting teachers, I talk to them about how important thinking is. And it's the reason why we do things is important. But we're making 3,000 odd decisions a day in the classroom. There's no way we can have those all 
you know, in front of us. And the same way observations don't work be- and you can't get validity or reliability from them because, you know, it's impossible to, to judge what pe- someone's thinking. So I think it's really, it's really important that you give them the best opportunity to see here are my guiding principles. It's, it's a lot like Lloyd's task where, where he asks people to bring research. You get a feel for whether or not you're pedagogically aligned because, you know, there are many, many different ways to approach teaching. And you, if you can sort of show that you're on the, on the level, at least with the, with the people who are responsible for the appointment um, and, and the interview process, then you get a, a sense of, of your fit, you know, whether if they, they might disagree and think, well, actually, you know, we don't, we don't necessarily utilize direct instruction in the way that it could be here. So, you know, you're probably getting a, an early warning. Um, and then on, on your safe lesson uh, thing, it, you know, it, it's, it's just like that. It's like a, a, a flag, you know, I don't want to say red flag because not everybody is a, a fit for every school, but, you know, safe, many, many, many safe lessons will equate to many, many, many gains in learning over the, over the long term, you know, so it's those, those kind of things help you to make your own decision at the end of the day, don't they? And that, that is exactly what happened because when I'd arrived at the school, the uh, another um, interviewee was just coming out of a class and they had this box and it was full of like all these different like arts and crafts and toys and stuff. And um, the I, like the deputy head of science said, oh, that was a really good lesson. Thanks for coming. We'll, we'll uh, let you know in the next couple of days sort of thing. And when they said that, I was like, I thought to myself, my lesson is not anything like that. It's not all singing and all dancing. And if that's what they're looking for, this probably isn't going to go well. I taught it. And then they gave that feedback of that was a very safe lesson. And I thought, like you said, this probably isn't the school for me. Um, and it, it helped, like you say, it, it helps you to make those decisions. And this is the importance of visiting a school. If we're harking back to that first point, because if you don't do that, then you don't identify those issues and you go all the way through the process. And you feel like you waste a lot of time. And I wasted an awful lot of time with personal statements, visiting schools, interviews, and so on. So it's really about sort of trying to reduce that down for yourself. In worst case scenario, you get the job, don't realize that uh, you're going to be spending your time pushing against the grain. And we all know at least one or two people who are in that situation. And, and you know, they're trying to utilize the, you know, good bets for, the teaching of uh, children and uh, and it's a, it's a really difficult place to be you know there are a lot of things i can put up with but if i'm not pedagogically aligned with school leaders i'm not going to put half as much effort in as i as i could you know because you know we bust a gut as teachers you want to feel like you're doing something productive with that uh, with that effort you know so yeah yeah I'm, and I, I like i have been that person going against the grain and um i think it is not it's not fair on yourself. Like, as you say, we work incredibly hard in our profession and to get up every day and then go and work in an organization that thinks differently to how you, how you think it's just cognitive dissonance. And, and you find yourself like, and you end up being like unhappy and not enjoying it. Um, and we like, we don't want, we've got a problem with teacher retention in our profession. And I imagine something like that may contribute to it. So always try elsewhere. Like I was very fortunate in my career to be like when I didn't like one school, I went to another school and it completely changed my view of education. I was like, oh, like schools can be like this and, and instead of that. And if I were to have stayed in, in the other school, I probably would quit teaching. So always try another school. Always try another school. Yeah, definitely. I mean, a change is as good as a, well, I don't know what the, how to phrase this because yeah, you can end up changing profession. Um, yeah, solid advice. Is there anything else you think it would be useful for people to know before we wrap up today's episode? Yeah, just uh, sort of a few general tips here. The first being um, seek advice from others. Um, Matt Swain is a friend of the pod. He gave me some invaluable advice uh, when I was um, attending deputy head interviews. Um, I'm very fortunate to have people like here and Lloyd to talk to. They gave me invaluable advice as well. Uh, my old deputy head, Jenny, was incredibly helpful. And like these are people who've been through the process themselves. So you can get their their expertise and their knowledge and, and use that to guide you. If you've applied for a school and you haven't heard back, uh, contact them because um, some schools as, as a sort of matter of fun won't, um, won't contact you if you've been unsuccessful. And I had applied for the school, hadn't heard back. And I thought, oh, I'll message anyway, just to see. 
and I emailed them and they were like, oh yeah, you've got an interview. Did you not get our email? And it, they just hadn't sent it to me, but they thought they had or whatever. So, and then I would, would have potentially missed out on an interview there because I didn't, so contact them if you haven't had back. If you're listening to this and you're thinking, this is me in a few years trying to go for a SLT role or a different teacher role, try and beef up your application. So by that, I mean, start going on MPQs. Think about the CPD you're doing that, that will support what it is you want to go into. If you want to go into being a SENCO, then you should be doing CPD around uh, special educational needs and, and leading those and how to support those in the classroom. If you want to go into being an assessment lead or a teacher and learning lead, then you need to be attending CPD around teaching learning and so on and so on. And then my final thing, and I, I say this as someone who like struggled a lot initially having, um, getting a lot of like being turned away a lot, it don't take feedback to heart. You just got to learn from each time and then apply that knowledge to the next one. And it was only through these countless, countless interviews where I'd failed this and failed that and failed this, that I was able to build up this bank of knowledge that made it so that every time I wrote a personal statement, I started getting invited to interview every time. Whereas at the start, I was barely getting interviewed to one out of 10 applications. Um, so don't take that feedback to heart, roll with the punches, and then use what you learn from it to go forward and then apply it. And, and don't just assume that that first job you apply for is, the, is gonna be the one you, you're gonna get. You might be applying for quite a while before, um, before you get one. But all, I wish everyone all the best with doing so. I mean, and despite going through lots of interviews, you've probably ended up with something close to your dream role now, though, after, after all that perseverance, haven't you? Because you, you literally have taken all the feedback on board. You've taken your experiences on board. You've reflected on them. And then you, it's made you into a much stronger applicant. And now you're, you know, you're living the dream, so to speak, with the, with the PKC team. I like, um, yeah, that's, that's exactly right. Like everything I learned from all those previous interviews and so on. And, I, and with the PKC interview, it actually came very, very late in the year to the point that I don't think there would have been any more jobs to apply for or to interview for. So it was very much like last chance saloon, but using everything I'd learned from the other interviews I'd done in, in the months previous, it, it benefited me a lot. And, and in that interview, I had to deliver a presentation I had to discuss at length with like my now line manager and a colleague and that's sort of like a this form interview. Um, so I took all of that information and it made it far more, uh, I, I, well, what I would say is by the time it came to that point, I felt incredibly confident at interviews because I'd failed so many times. I built up this knowledge. It made it, as I said, that star approach on it, almost second nature. And, and I, I get nervous just like any, everyone, everyone does those first few interviews. I'm like, you're wearing a suit but your armpit if they could see your armpits they're, they're, they're you're sweating um, madly but all that confidence comes with it's as the same anything practice 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 and that's another thing to keep in mind is that like if you do want to go for a role in the future why not go and uh, apply for roles now to try and get some practice you may not get it but that practice to me was invaluable i cannot um, stress that enough how much going to interviews helped me build my interview practice perfect yeah, so hopefully this is useful for anyone listening. I mean, and yeah, like you say, getting match fit, so to speak, for the uh, for the interviews because I know it's um it's prime interview season as we move into term. What would it be term five next term? Oh my goodness, time flies! All I have to do is say thank you very much. Thank you very much, Elliot. Thank you, and everyone at home. Until next time, thanks for listening. <laughs>